Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Tales of Cape Cod. It's so exciting to be back again, and uh, I see a lot of new faces, and that's really exciting, too. So I um, hope everybody had a great winter, and we're going to have a great summer. Before we start, I would like to go through some housekeeping items. One, I want to thank tonight's sponsors. Barnesville Sea Farms has donated the shellfish. Uh, Lenny and Chris Clark will serve. Robert and Elizabeth Betty of Cape Cod Family Charters contributed. And Titcombs Books Shop will be here today to sell books. Um, <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes, sponsors are a very important part of uh, our pro program because that enables us to get quality speakers and um, also contribute to this wonderful building that we well, love so much. Um, next week, we're going to have James H. Ellis, who is a West Barnesville historian, and he will talk about the luminaries of West Barnesville, James Otis, Jr., Mercy Otis Warren, um, Mad Jack Percival, and Lemuel Shaw. Um, I do want to mention the Constant Contact news newsletter that we send out. If you um, would like to receive it and don't, please seek me out and give me your email, and I'll be sure to put you on the list so you will get weekly notifications of what's going on. Um, later in the summer, we're going to introduce a uh, brick program. We're doing an accessibility project here at the courthouse. We're going to um, create a, a better entrance for uh, people that are challenged, um, if physically challenged and don't want to climb up our steps anymore. Um, and. Part of that project is going to be realigning our bricks. So we're going to be selling bricks later on this summer. It's a good opportunity to memorialize uh, your loved ones or for speakers who have been here before to memorialize the fact that you were our speaker. Um, we're also looking for volunteers. Um, we need people in, that are skilled in marketing, uh, a graphic designer would be nice because I do the posters and I don't do them as great as they could be. Um, we need help with admissions. Diane does a great job, but she needs a day off every once in a while. Um, we need help with our website. Um, we need to uh, develop that a little bit more than it is. And Jude could use a little help with desserts. So if anybody's talented in any of those ways, please let me know. I'd love to um, have you help us out. You don't have to be a member of the board, just um, a treasured volunteer would be fine. So about our speaker this evening. Sandy McFarlane is a coastal sustainability author. She has lived her entire life by the sea like many kids, she grew up loving the water, and her curiosity about all things marine began in youth and continues. Aided by 40 years of hands-on experience in resource evaluation, policy and management, and decades of recreational rowing in a 14-foot Cape Dory sailboat she used as a rowing skiff, she learned about the biological and physical world around her. In the process, she also gained insight into the social, political, and economic landscape of coastal communities. She is past president of the New England Estuarine Research Society and a member of numerous professional societies and community outreach. After graduating from the University of Massachusetts, she settled in the Cape Town of Orleans, 
where, her, where she began her professional career as a shellfish biologist for the town of Orleans. Later, she was appointed as the town's first conservation administrator. She retired from government in 1998, was awarded a master's degree in resource management from Antioch, New England Graduate School, and founded Coastal Resource Specialists, a consulting company devoted to shellfish, coastal, and watershed issues. I'm very proud and very pleased to introduce our speaker, Sandy McFarlane. Thank you, Anne, and thank you everyone for coming. This is wonderful to see so many people here today. I'm delighted to be here. But I'm going to get going right with it. Okay. When I was trying to put together this pr presentation, I was asked to do it by the New England Estuarine Research Society originally, because they were celebrating their 50th anniversary as well. And I was asked to give a, a talk on shellfish in New England over 50 years, and I said, one talk? Okay. <laughs> I'll give it a shot. And what I tried to do was to, was to focus on the people, the places, and the research that went on over the last 50 years that brought us to the place we are and how we know the shellfish industry today. But we have to go back. Where do I point this thing to? Ah, go back even further than 50 years, um, closer to the turn of the century, because there were companies in Connecticut and New York that were doing some little bit of husbandry. And those are the, uh, some of them are the Rowe Company, the Blue Points Company in New York, and Frank Flowers in New York also. But we are lucky in, sorry. We're lucky in Massachusetts because we had this gentleman, Dr. David Belding. He was, uh, when he graduated from Williams College, he went to the uh, uh, Massachusetts uh, Fisheries Commission and got a job looking at, um, his, his job was to look at the life histories of clams, quahogs, scallops, and oysters. He had a little building on Chequesset Neck and Wellfleet, and he got started. And as of the early 1910s, he wrote monographs on each one of those species. And he did, he looked at the life histories, fisheries, and p propagation potential. These are gems of documents. They are out of print uh, long ago, but the uh, Cape Cod Cooperative Extension has put them together in one volume. And for anybody who is really interested in shellfish, these are well worth it. They're, they're ex as, well, as well as good as they were the day that they were published. But to, we're going to start the tour in Maine. Maine has a tremendous coastline, a uh, very varied coastline, but they have one of their main industries, we all know about lobsters, but another one is softshell clams. And that man, Dana Wallace, spent his, almost his entire career on clams. And at, at some time around these 50 years ago, a marauder came along and basically started to destroy the clam flats, and that marauder is called the green crab. And so he spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to outwit the green crabs so that the fishermen could continue to fish. In about 1970, Ira Darling donated almost 150 um, acres to the University of Maine, which became the Darling Marine Center on the Damariscotta River. The first thing they did was to build a building with a flowing seawater system. They put tanks in it, and they, they, that, that allowed their researchers to study various animals under controlled conditions. They hired Herb Haidu, who had been in various um, institutions around the country, and he was, became the father of marine aquaculture. He did a lot of field experiments with clam survival and gregarious setting, which is nothing more than an acknowledgement that shelf, some shell, species of shellfish set with their own kind. Um, clams, mussels, and oysters are definitely in that, in that category. But he also developed the first graduate level uh, major of marine mariculture in the country. They hired Sam Chapman to run the, the, the building, the seawater system in the hatchery. He had a green thumb with animals. He could grow just about anything. Amazing guy. 
But he was also a proponent of small hatcheries, mom and pop operations. And so we went around the Midcoast area and there were a lot of uh, hatcheries uh, bringing up in basements and garages on the Midcoast area. The Darling Center now is, looks quite different than it did back then. There are two new buildings, each with a seawater system. There is um, uh, laboratories and office space, and they even have a dormitory, all located by the water, a whole new docking facility. Uh, they put a lot of money into the Darling Center lately. Up the, I mean, down the river was Ed Myers. He was the first successful guy to culture mussels in Maine. And he learned a lot in the process of doing this, including the fact that eider ducks can dive down 30 feet. And so he had to figure out a way to protect his mussels from the eider ducks. Across the river was Bob Guillard. He was at the Big, uh, Bigelow, Lab, Bigelow Lab for Ocean Sciences. He started his collection in Milford in the 1950s and continued and expanded it when he was at Woods Hole Oceanographic. Then he moved to Bigelow in Maine and continued that. He developed the method of growing marine algae, which is the food for shellfish. He developed what is known as the F over 2 medium, which I believe is still used in a lot of shellfish hatcheries to this day. Um, and now it's one of the, it is one of the larger, the, it houses one of the largest collections of marine algae in the world. Down east, um, uh, Brian Beal was working at the University of Maine in Machias. And he was working with six towns in down east Maine, which is a very poor community, uh, poor county in Maine. And they were concerned about the fact that a lot of their clams were disappearing, mainly because of the green crabs too. So he went to work, working with Sam to try and figure out what to do. And they developed one of the small hatcheries, taking a page out of Sam's book, to develop a, a hatchery to grow softshell clams. And softshell clams are not as easy as oysters in the hatchery process, so they developed what they could to get clams growing. And they created this facility. They moved into a bigger building shortly thereafter. And now it is called the Down East Institute. And it is this amazing place that has researchers, a place for students, visitors. They collaborate with people from across the bay, Passamaquoddy Bay in Canada. They're growing cold water species. And it's the only cold water uh, facility in the United States. OK, moving west, we have Milford, Connecticut. That is the home of the National Marine Fisheries Service Milford Laboratory, fondly known by us as just the Milford Lab or just plain Milford. All I have to say is Milford, everybody knows what you're talking about. At any rate, that was established in 1931 and joined the National Marine Fisheries Service in the 1970s. It is the only lab in the whole uh, group of labs that the, that the National Marine Fisheries Service has that specializes in shellfish. It's the only one in the country. It was, first director was Victor Lusanoff, who was um, very instrumental. In fact, he actually wrote the manual on rearing bivalve mollusks, which meant that he developed all of the, the procedures to have a hatchery. And he did that in, in basically the mid to late 60s. So when I talk about 50 years, I'm talking about a real break when it went from seat of the, not seat of the pants, but from commercial fishing being um, wild harvest to um, aquaculture. The lab has an algae uh, uh, collection as well. And Gary Wickfers, who is the, the lab director, is also the curator of their algae collection. And any hatchery in the country that needs a starter culture can go to Gary and say that they need some, uh, some algae, and he'll be able to send it to you. You could also go to Bigelow Lab and get one from them as well. The things that they are working on in Milford are just uh, really uh, high-level research um, having to do with almost anything that you can, can think of that has to do with shellfish. In the 1980s or so, they were working very heavily on bay scallops because throughout the range of bay scallops, they would drop in like flies as far as, as, as um, population was concerned. So they had a, a whole lot of raceways outside, which is... Um, Probably will get it. Up in the corner over there. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Raceways, uh, they were outside, but then they also had some covered ones. When they had the raceways, they had the water coming in on one end and going out on the other end, and they could still manipulate what, was, what they were doing with the animals and with the, the seawater system that they had. But they developed, uh, through their research, 
a manual on uh, rearing of bay scallops, which are different than oysters and how to raise them. They also did field work out in Long Island Sound. They borrowed the method from the Japanese called uh, lantern nets, but as you can see how big those things are, they need deep water in order to grow scallops and lantern nets. All those guys are now retired, but they did a lot of work on bay scallops back then. And then between those two states, we have Massachusetts. Massachusetts didn't have any of the research facilities, and the only way that Massachusetts could get more shellfish in the water was to transplant seed or the seed or adults from one body of water and transplant it to another and hope that Mother Nature would do the rest. Uh, Phil Schwind in East Ham was a character in and of his own right, but he also had a semi-enclosed pond that he could deal with. And so he got cohogs from Cape Cod Bay and transplanted them to the milk, I mean to the salt pond and had that opened up for recreational fishing on Sundays. And it worked very well for him and he actually did get sets of cohogs out of what he was doing. And the bottom right is um, uh, Alfred Redfield, who was working at Woods Hole Oceanographic, he had looked at Belding's um, monographs on clams and realized that turning over the bottom is a good thing. And so he was working in Barnstable Harbor for uh, clam propagation. But in Massachusetts, each town manages their own shellfish resources under general guidelines by the state. It's an odd system. We're the only ones that do it. Maine has, a, has part of our plan. But no, every other state manages their shellfish through the state. We're the only ones that do it this way. So the town, it was a town's responsibility to do the propagation. But this is back in the day when people were bull raking, and, and they were bull raking out in Cape Cod Bay, which is in deep water, with these enormous rakes and, and enormous poles that were 30, 40 feet long um, and standing on the gunnel of a boat. And so this transition, 50 years after 50 years, is, was really a, a real break in what was going on in the shellfish world. Finally, the hatchery method, it was um, commercialized. And we got wind of the fact that a hatchery in North Carolina was willing to sell seed to the towns. And so several of the towns bought that seed. First, before we bought it, Falmouth bought some seed, or got a hold of some seed anyway, um, and tried two different methods. Uh, George Souza was the constable in Falmouth at the time. They had had an oil spill in uh, Barnesville Harbor, I mean in, in Falmouth, West Falmouth Harbor, which had killed a lot of their stock. And so what they were doing was um, trying two different methods. Uh, George came up with these floating sandbox rafts idea, and the state had uh, basically bread boxes that people, um, companies brought their bed, bread to grocery stores in. Those didn't work very well, but the floating sandboxes worked really great. And part of the reason for that is the predators are all on the bottom because that's where the cohogs are. Here it is on the surface, so they didn't have any predators to bother about. And they were just, they had all the food was on the, the surface water too. So they were growing like crazy. There was just a really, really well um, designed program. But you can't fill a whole body of water with these rafts. So we did what we could. Anyway, uh, some of the towns at that time was in the uh, late 70s. Um, inflation was rampant. And some of the towns realized or thought that maybe if we did our own hatcheries, we would be better off than buying seed because we couldn't, we'd have to buy smaller and smaller seed and we couldn't deal with the real small seed in the systems that we had. So um, Martha's Vineyard had the Martha's Vineyard Shellfish Group, that's on the left. Um, East Ham had an old Boca Town boathouse in the middle and Orleans had a building that we moved to the water. All of us went into the hatchery world um, some more successful than others. The Martha's Vineyard Shellfish Group was definitely the most successful. But then a new a method came along called an upweller, which um, made things a lot different and a lot easier for all of us. Um, and so the, um, I'll get to what the upweller is. Okay, the, the whole process of a hatchery is to, first of all, get the animals to spawn and, and watch what they do and then put them, the, the eggs and sperm, into a large container. And that, in this case, we use trash cans. We were doing it with a, really a shoestring budget. And then draining them down and through sieves that we use with free five-gallon buckets and then growing our own algae. When the upweller came along, 
what we, what we could do is to buy seed and not have to go through that process from the eggs and put the seed in a container which had netting on the bottom, put the container in some sort of a tank, have the water of a flow through system that was going on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, have that water going into the tank up through the container that had the seed and then back out again. That meant that the seed was always feeding on the algae, the natural algae that was in the water, the natural plankton. So it worked really, really well. You could put a lot of animals in a small space and get the things out, out of the building like in the late fall. On the right represents one million seed, that little packet. So that's what we were dealing with. Our successes got, went to commercial people. And they realized that, or a lot of them realized that they could maybe make some money and go into business of raising seafood, I mean raising seafood, raising shellfish. And especially they started with quahogs and basically started with Wellfleet, where they were putting quahogs on the bottom just like we were doing, covering it over with netting to protect it from predation, and letting them sit there for a while, a couple of years, two or three years, whatever it was, and then get them, that would get them to a little neck size and they could sell them. And it was working very well. And then they switched to oysters and, and tried their hand with oysters too. But the towns weren't just working with quahogs. Um, we were working with soft shell clams too. And as I said earlier, uh, turning over the bottom is beneficial. And so in Orleans, we literally plowed the bottom. And what we would do is if we had an area where there were uh, seed, we have clams, a lot of seed clams, too many that were going, that were going to live, they weren't all gonna live, we would try to, to uh, get some of them out of there and sort of thin them out and take that seed and plant them in what we, the area that we had just plowed. And we weren't really weren't sure whether it was going to work, but we planted it on an incoming tide. The clams would dig in really fast, and then we'd go back and check them. And it worked really well as far as, as plowing and planting. They would survive. But they wouldn't uh, throw off a set because most of these areas were barren probably for a reason. And one of those reasons may be that it was a volatile environment. And especially Cape Cod Bay, I, when you have the rippled sand, it's really in a um, volatile environment. So I don't, you probably can't see it, but in the bottom right, there are rows of holes, siphon holes. And that showed us that they survived their transplant in this environment, but they just wouldn't set. If we put netting down, then yes, they would set under the netting. But again, we, couldn't, we just couldn't do that for everything. So we would, they, up in Maine, they were doing the same thing. They were putting netting all over their flats to try and protect their clams and try to get a set of clams also. But they, they found the same thing that we did, that it's just prohibitively expensive to go around and put you know, acres and acres of netting on a, on a flat. So it just didn't work as well as we had hoped. When you do that, when you put a lot of animals in one place, you're bound to get some disease problems. And that's what happened with quahogs in some of these um, areas. They developed, a, or they, there was a disease that, that was rampant. It's, in, it's, it's naturally in the water, but it sort of takes off when everything is crowded together. And that was, was named a QPX, quahog parasite unknown. And finally, Roxana Smolowitz, it's a shellfish pathologist, did get it named. I can't remember exactly what the name is, scientific name for it is, but anyway, it has a name. And Walter Blagoslowski from the Milford Lab was working on two very well-known oyster diseases called MSX and Dermo. Down in New Jersey, the Haskin Lab had been going on for a very, very long time. And it started with the father and son team of Julius and um, Thurlow Nelson. They passed away at different times, and Hal Haskin took over, and then after him was Dave Bushek, who is the, the uh, lab director now. Susan Ford, for her entire life, was or almost her entire career, was working on trying to develop uh, disease-resistant strains of oysters, which she was able to do. Uh, she passed away several years ago, and before she passed away, she had, had developed uh, uh, disease-resistant strains. And so most of the oysters, especially down the Chesapeake Bay and that area south, have been using those strains of oysters. Stan Allen was working on a different route, uh, looking at the genetics of the oysters. Okay, in New Hampshire, they don't have a big bay. I mean, they don't have a lot of area for shellfish. But what they do have is Great Bay in New Hampshire. 
And they have the University of New Hampshire nearby and the Jackson Estuarine Rep, which is on the bay itself. Fred Short is a seagrass expert. And he was looking at the decline in eelgrass, specific, specifically eelgrass, throughout its entire range and wondering what was happening to the eelgrass. And so he, he was working on this. And uh, Joe Costa did a study in Wakoit Bay. And he was looking at the decline of, of eelgrass in Wakoit Bay. And from 1951, the map on the left to 1987, the one on the right, the lack of eelgrass is absolutely dramatic. Well, that has a connection to shellfish because bay scallops want to set on something. And what they usually set on, what they, one of their favorite things to set on is eelgrass. And one of the reasons that they choose eelgrass is because of the flimsy of the leaves. That means that they, when they're very, very young, they can, they can attach to the leaves, but as they grow older, they can drop down. Well, while they're young, a crab can't crawl up a blade of grass, so they're protected from their predators. So it's a, it's a refuge for them. So as the eelgrass was declining, the scallops were declining. Now, that's the, not the only thing they set on, but they are the, they, that was what was happening. Well, it turns out that Eelgrass is extremely sensitive to water quality. And it turns out that scallops are also extremely sensitive to water quality. So you had this combination of the lack of eelgrass and the lack of scallops, and all of a sudden things are starting to make some sense. The top uh, picture of the eelgrass is a, is a very healthy meadow where you just see the grass. The one on the bottom is one that has a few sparse uh, blades of grass, and then you have a lot of, eel of other seaweeds in between. That's a sure sign that there is um, excess nutrients in the water. So at the, that same time, uh, Scott Nixon and Ivan Valiella were looking at the nutrient question, uh, nitrogen, specifically nitrogen, and what that was doing in the environment. And in, in Rhode Island, the, Scott had developed these, what they call mesocosms, which were these gigantic tanks that they can fill with water and fill with anything else that they wanted and can manipulate anything inside so they can do all their experiments. And Ivan Valiello was working outside with uh, students in different marsh situations to find out what happened if you add, keep adding nitrogen, keep adding, keep adding, keep adding, what happens to it. That led to other studies. And those studies, one of them was done by the National Park Service. And that was done um, with the Nauset estuary where they were doing a flyover with a plane that had a thermal imagery can camera. And that camera was taking pictures in late August when the, the differential between groundwater that is coming in underground at a, at a steady temperature and the warmest part of the water, of the salt water, are in place. So the cold, fresh water is coming in, out and floating on top of the the heavier, warmer salt water below it. And all that gray on the left-hand side is basically groundwater coming in off the land 24-7. And so groundwater was becoming a very, very big issue. And the nutrients coming into the groundwater were basically from all of our septic systems. That was the, that's the main source of it. There was also um, fertilization of lawns and gardens and also runoff from roads. But the, the heavy duty part was the, the um, nitrogen coming in from the septic systems. Anyway, that led to, the, that information led to identifying and delineating watersheds. And on the, this, this part of the Cape, um, it's pretty simple. It's either going to Cape Cod Bay or it's going to the Nantucket Sound. But there are towns like Orleans and Chatham where it gets complicated. It's either going to, in Orleans, it's either going to Cape Cod Bay, the Atlantic Ocean, or Nantucket Sound. So these watersheds are really important. And in order to, to look at that, you need to look at each individual watershed by itself. That led to integrating all of this. So all of this work was going on all over the place, and people were starting to put the two and two together and come up with these plans. Virginia Lee was looking at water quality from a different perspective. She was looking at it from the perspective of how many people can they get out on the water to do testing. And researchers at the time weren't trusting citizen scientists. And she said, no. She said, if you train these people, she said, you're going to get the same good results that you do with a researcher. You just have to train them properly. Well, once that came out, then 
things started to really pop because they had a lot of people doing a lot of water quality, quality sampling and they were able to piece together what was happening in these estuaries and, in, and instead of looking at it as a piece, they could now start to put it together as, as an estuary-wide program. And so Brian Howes was hired to do um, mass, the estuary programs for the whole of the state of Massachusetts and almost every estuary in Massachusetts is now mapped that shows what the situation is now and what would happen if nothing was done and then what will happen if this nitrogen keeps coming and coming and coming into the water and how these areas are going to be degraded. So is it, the, and every town has these, and you can go to your town hall and, and look for the National Estuary, I mean the Massachusetts Estuary Program and see what it says for your town. Well, all of this was going on, all of these, the, a lot of the people who were growing shellfish were saying, okay, well now we've got a lot of information. We're armed with this information of how we can grow our business. And so all of these guys on the left were part of Herb Haidu's initial mariculture course. They went into business on the Damariscotta River growing oysters. They're still in business. And they are sort of the grandfathers of the, of the shellfish industry. And they're, they're really, really neat guys. And they've been in this business for a very, very long time. Uh, Dick sold his, his company to somebody not that long ago. But then oh, in Long Island, in Peconic Bay, Karen Rivaro was really instrumental in getting aquaculture going in that area. And she became uh, uh, um, past president of the East Coast Shellfish Growers Association. So you know, these people are, are really up and coming in what's going on in shellfish. So it leads to this vibrant, expanding shellfish aquaculture industry that we have on all of our coasts. And Delaware and Texas were the last states to join the party. And just recently, Texas has allowed leasing for private aquaculture. But, and, and Delaware wasn't that long ago that they allowed it. So every state now has a leasing program where, where people can lease some area and uh, get into the business of shellfish aquaculture. They have different types of gear. Everybody does their own thing. Um, some people copy one another, it's uh, bottom gear, it can be floating gear, it's all kinds of things. But there are, all, there are issues, it's not going to just happen if you just put shellfish in the water and expect it to grow a couple of years and be able to harvest it and, and sell it. There's a lot of fouling that goes on, that has to be cleaned regularly, and if you don't keep up with it, you're in real trouble because the amount of fouling is going to to eat all of the shelf, uh, the algae that's in the water and the stuff is gonna starve or they're gonna, it's gonna take the oxygen anyway, it, you're in trouble. So the East Coast Shellfish Growers Association went to, went to work and developed a um, best management practices manual for the shellfish aquaculture industry. And it included all kinds of things, including um, what to do about fouling, but also things like um, looking at the fact that leases are all in public waters and the public is watching. So um, even though you, you are leasing this area, it is, it is public water. So there's a, there's a lot of sort of consternation, especially with new leases, and people go through a lot of hoops in order to get a new lease. That's one side of the coin. Another side of the coin is shellfish restoration. And that, that takes place basically with a lot of no, uh, NGOs. And there are groups that want to do something about shellfish, whether it is adding shellfish to the water, uh, uh, reclaiming some of the shellfish habitat that's been lost, uh, mitigate some of the land-based uh, practices, uh, create reefs, return native species, return two native species. And they recruit volunteers and have training programs that are set up by most of the, the um, state sea grant agents and agriculture agents. These are great programs. For one reason is that the educational value alone of getting people, uh, citizens, to understand shellfish, what it takes to grow shellfish, what it takes to get it on the plate that we're going to be seeing, all of that they get to learn by doing these programs. They get wet and dirty and love it, and they think that they are giving something back to society by, by being part of these programs. And it's, they are really the terrific programs. And they're even using um, oysters, primarily oysters, but shellfish 
as a filtering organism to try and get nitrogen out of the water using this natural um, system of growing shellfish primarily for its ability to filter the water. And oysters can filter up to 50 gallons a day, and it can actually reduce the amount of nitrogen that's in the water. And so some towns are using that. Unfortunately, it's at the end of the system, not at the beginning where it starts at the septic system, but at least it's trying to keep the estuaries cleaner and taking a look at those plans that are coming down the pike of what's going to happen with more and more nitrogen coming in. This is one way of trying to mitigate that. Then we have the Billion Oyster Project. This is a fascinating project. Um, Pete Malinowski on the left and Murray Fisher on the right. Pete grew up in a shellfish growing family, uh, Fisher's Island um, shellfish in the eastern side of Long Island. And Murray is an educator. They had this brainstorm that they wanted to add a billion oysters to New York Harbor by 2035. And this is New York Harbor we're talking about. And they partnered with public school students and volunteers. And with the school kids, they have curricula, they have, uh, and they start with, with little kids and go all the way up to high school. When they get to high school, they can, they have separate, they can have, they can go to a separate high school where their whole course of study is like a, uh, like a tech school where they're learning marine uh, related uh, majors, uh, if you will. These numbers are a little, couple of years old, but 10,000 volunteers. 6,000 students, 100 schools, 75 restaurants they're working with. I mean, this thing is just unbelievable how far they've come in less than 10 years. It's just an amazing, a remarkable program. There are other success stories. There's Martha's Vineyard Shellfish Group, which has been doing their thing since 1976 to the present. They're still using the solar hatchery that they've got on the right, on the, on the right of the, the two of them. And then on the right to that, they have um, a building that used to be the lobster hatchery over there, and they're using part of it for, for their upweller facility. They've been growing scallops, uh, quahogs, and oysters since their inception, and they're one of the few places where there actually is a commercial harvest with, of scallops every year. It's just remarkable. And then there's Island Creek Oyster Farms in Duxbury. They have, have integrated their whole business from hatchery, nursery, grow out, wholesale, retail, and restaurants. It is, the, they've just gone gangbusters and done the whole thing, making it all theirs, and they've done it all in about 25 years or so. And there's shellfish festivals all over the place, and they, they draw thousands of people. The uh, Pemaquid is the one in Maine. Um, it's in, I think, uh, early September. Uh, Milford Oyster, I think, is in August. Uh, Wellfleet is in October, and there's even one in Baktouche, New Brunswick, which is an oyster capital in, in uh, Canada. The Milford Lab, for over 40 years, has been hosting and sponsoring uh, what they call the Milford Aquaculture Seminar, which is a, a day and a half program where people come from all over to uh, listen to presentations. And it is uh, researchers, regulators, managers, growers, um, extension people, um, and stakeholder, any other stakeholder that wants to come. It's just, it's been a remarkable, remarkable run. And the people at the Milford Lab will share their research, but they also listen to other people. And when they hear a problem that somebody is having and they're, they're bringing it forward, then they will put that on their agenda to try and solve the problem. So it's a, it's a real collaborative uh, group that meets once a year. It's been wonderful. And with that, I have all of these people to thank, people and, and institutions all over the place that have helped me over the years in, in putting this also together. And it's really nice to go to shellfish meetings because you can be assured that there's going to be a reception and there's going to be shellfish there. <laughs> so with that, I thank you very much, and I'd love to answer any questions anybody has if I can.
I, I didn't, uh, I just went, one second, I, I didn't mention the, the book over here, that is my book, Swirling Currents. The, the shellfish is part of that, but there's a lot of other marine issues in that book that that's, um, Ray is going to be looking at, uh, helping self. Anyway, yes, Bob? You mentioned that there's some limited success in rearing scallops, space scallops. Mm -hmm. Is that a model that can be followed elsewhere? Is there any hope for other locations? And is there anything experimentally being done to create a, a facsimile or a substitute for the regress that's missing? And I know that's not the only thing that's probably important. Uh, as far as the scallops are concerned, first of all, they're a, an interesting animal. It's interesting. And um, Martha's Vineyard has had really great success that, that they're doing it. And Nantucket is trying to do it with their hatchery, too, to, make, to, to try and keep their uh, commercial fishery alive. But they're the only two places that are, have been relatively successful at growing scallops and, and enough, of a, uh, enough of an area to make it work. There hasn't been that much success in recruitment of the ones that they put out there. Um, and that's one of the bottlenecks of all of this, is trying to help Mother Nature, but sometimes it just doesn't work. So that's that one. There have been some experiments with, um, I don't want to say astroturf, but something along those lines, you know, long plastic stuff um, for scallops. And from what I've, I've read and understood, it, it, they don't like it. <laughs> So it's not the only thing that they'll attach to. They'll attach to other things if there's nothing there, but they really do prefer eelgrass. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Absolutely. Nitrogen is not nitrogen is not a a um, pollutant. Nitrogen is a, an element, and so it, you, you're putting it on your own garden as a fertilizer. What's happening is that the estuaries are being over-fertilized with the excess nutrients coming into the bay. So the fact that oysters are glomming down the nitrogen has nothing to do with whether or not you can eat them. It's, it's just that's part of the algae that they're taking in. They're taking in all this algae that has, that has grown because of photosynthesis and the nitrogen available to them. So that's, it's, not a, it's not a pollutant, it's not, it's not dangerous at all. No, no, no. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm not sure. I've tried to keep up with what's going on in the pond as far as um, what's, what they're taking on and how they're, they're managing that, and I'm, I'm really not sure. I, can't, I don't want to answer without knowing fully what I'm, what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, thought that they were, I thought that they were sinking them in on the wintertime, sinking the rafts and the, the, the floating gear in the wintertime and not taking it out, but I'm, I'm not sure. Yes, in the back. Yep. <laughs> there, there are there are a lot of snails that have a um, um, organ that acts just like a drill, and and you can see a, a, for a moon snail, it's a it's a uh, I can't remember the size, but it's a countersunk hole. I mean, it's perfect countersunk hole, and it will just suck it out. So in the, if they don't eat, if they can't get at it, then that hole will just, uh, the, the animal will rot by itself. So, we, you know, it's one of those things. It is a predator. I mean, they are predators. Yes, ma'am. Um, what is being done with the water quality to uh, increase the salinity of the water that they are taking in from the friends? Same thing for the shellfish. Get rid of the nitrogen. That's that's part of that's part of the problem is that it's just too much nitrogen, and so that's allowing the sea the seaweeds to grow, and the it's it's just off balance for the eelgrass. So other things are taking over, and it's shading the eelgrass, so it, they can't get the sunlight, 
and by, when it can't get sunlight, then it can't grow very well. So it's, it's all connected. And you know, what's, what's good for these, these other seaweeds is bad for the eelgrass. When the eelgrass turns out to be a, uh, basically a keystone species, so that it's a, it's, it's a sign of the health of an estuary. With, with septic system, uh, um, all of the CAPE, when they're doing all of this work with uh, water I mean, wastewater treatment plants, that's, that's one of the reasons that the, the CAPE is going through that, is to try and address this issue. Very expensive way, but it's, that's what's happening. Yes, sir. The wash. It, it's, uh, it's the, uh, yeah, the, the estuaries is is one. Of, I mean, the estuaries. The eelgrass is one of those things that is the good news and the bad news. <laughs> the good news is that it helps the environment. The bad news is that it gets caught in the propeller. So you know the boaters are not happy about you know going zooming around and then having to stop and put it in reverse and then zoom along and anyway that happens all the time so it's like i said good news and bad news but yeah and and also the propellers will will send up sediment and put sediment into suspension again and anything that had dropped down that was sort of out of the out of the um um process gets put into the process again so it's it's never ending battle but you're right, the boat propellers are damaging too. Yes, sir. Regarding uh, oyster reefs, uh -huh. uh, I remember talking to Tom Marcotti, uh, he was the, uh, yep. the, the Tom's shellfish biologist, and uh, I was asking him about uh, maybe establishing oyster reefs. And he said, well, you know, uh, as they grow, it's fine they, they take a knife and because they're eating the algae, and, uh, so they remove the nitrogen and they grow bigger and everything. But then, if they don't harvest them and take the, the animals out of the water, they end up dying and the nitrogen goes right back in. Yep. So I know there are some places that are uh, growing, uh, or promoting the building of oyster reefs. And uh, just, you know, don't they have to be harvested? Yes, but there are also, there are also other reasons for, for creating reefs. And one of those is for um, lessening the intensity of waves. And so there, there are some places like along a riverbank where um, eelgrass, I'm not eelgrass, marsh grass is um, dropping into a, a, a river because of boat propellers or storm waves. These reefs will, will um, work in that, in that favor. So places down south are doing their, um, a lot of them are building reefs to try and help on the storm surge part of the equation. So, anyone else? Yes, sir. I have not kept track of red tide. I saw the signs in Nosset, but that was uh, a couple weeks ago, and I don't live in Orleans anymore, so I don't keep track of it. But um, it would be normal for, to, for it to be in Nauset. It would be unusual for it to be in Pleasant Bay. So, not out of the question, but who knows? <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. It, it's because the, this, the scholar population has crashed, basically, for every place that doesn't grow them in a hatchery. There's, there's just, there just aren't scallops 
in the wild. Very, very few scallops in the wild at, at this point, especially on, on the Cape. Very few. So come, every once in a while, the town will have a scallop season. As I said, they have this yo-yo anyway. So once in a while, there is a, a, a raise in the yo-yo, but it doesn't happen very often. And it's all over the, the whole Northeast. I mean, it's not just here. We were one of the last places, actually, that still had, had uh, commercial uh, um, numbers of scallops. And what about the mussels? Mussels, um, they have a population dynamic, too. Where sometimes they're gone for 10 years or so, and then they come back again. Um, I'm not really clear on what's going on with mussels, but I've heard a lot about mussels being um, really in short supply everywhere, and I don't know what's happening with them. Yes, sir? Oh boy, <laughs> how long have you got? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot coming down the pike. There's a lot happening now. Um, and you can pretty much almost, almost safely say that the world, the, the, the waters that we know now, will almost everything about them will be changing. And part of that is because the Gulf of Maine is warming up faster than most of the planet, especially the northern part of Gulf of Maine, but it's happening in the southern part of Gulf of Maine as well. And I just read an article just today that um, uh, some of the scientists are saying it won't be long before southern New England gets that too. And they're finding all kinds of different southern species up here, and uh, northern species are moving further north. So there's predator-prey relationships that are screwy at this point. Um, there's food availability that is, that is in flux. Everything is in flux, I mean everything. So it's just, um, it's, it's very, it's very, it was disconcerting for one thing, but it's, it's sort of a head spinner on another. Well, I think okay. so. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Don't stampede, but dinner is served. <laughs>